many human beings have conceived of. Now, how does one get this salvation? This is often a question that's raised in Muslim Christian dialogue, uh, because often our Christian friends see salvation as being a little bit more complex than what Muslims see it. Muslims see it as a very simple thing. You listen to the message from God, either you choose to obey it or not. If you obey it, you know, you go to paradise. If you don't obey it, you go to the hellfire. End of story. It seems very simple. And uh, often our Christian friends wonder, can it really be so simple? And uh, I, in fact, I say yes. The, the way the, the Bible has been compiled over time, when we read it now as a single document, certain things appear which is not representative of the way it originally should have appeared. Sometimes, for example, you read through the book of Genesis, you go through its present form, and you notice, first of all, that God created everything, He noticed that everything was good, including human beings. And then, eventually, God discovers that, no, human beings are not so good. This is by chapter 6 in Genesis. But that every evil, every inclination of the heart is evil right from the very beginning. So God decides, I'm going to limit the years to 120 years. But then you keep reading and you find out that God is going to do something more. God still is not happy with his previous decision and now he decides to wipe out the people through a flood and to start over with the pure family of Noah. Now hopefully he will get you know, righteous citizens to dwell on the earth. But then that doesn't seem to work either, because after the flood, human beings are just as corrupt as they were before. So you, you wonder if, if you're, you're reading it right. And in fact, you're not reading it right, because that's not how God is supposed to be represented in the Bible. But what has happened is that the way the scriptures were compiled, the way that, that a piece from one text was joined together with a piece from another text, you're getting a number of stories together, and the stories do not agree. So the idea that the scholars have come upon, that the scriptures were compiled in the way that I described, actually makes sense. Now, pondering the issue all over again now, just to make sure it makes full and complete sense. The teachings of Jesus in the New Testament gives us a very simple method of salvation, just like what we understand in Muslim understanding. That if human beings and fail to do the right thing, they can always return to God, ask for His forgiveness, and God will forgive them. We find this especially represented in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15. We have a number of stories there told by Jesus to represent how God forgives human beings. Think of the story of the prodigal son, how the father forgives the prodigal son, and Jesus wants us to know, if that's really His teaching, that God will forgive us and welcome us with open arms, in a similar way to which the father in that story welcomed his disobedient son who was repentant. Uh, this is for Dr. Peterson. Uh, again, on the concept of God, it says, uh, Elias Church claims that Father, Jesus, and Holy, Holy Spirit are three separate gods, according to Mormon doctrine, especially by Bruce Earl McConkey. Can anybody check that on it? If this is so, how, how do you explain when you say that Holy Spirit, Spirit is a separate God which does not have a body and flesh. Because Mormons believe that Father and uh, Son, they, they are tentative, corporeal, like you said, you know, they are alive. And so the questioner asks, please explain then which kind of God he is and to what, to, to, to what class or classes of gods it or he belongs to. Should we take it that it or he belongs to a class of gods which are bodyless and passionless, if you say that Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, who is in himself, who in himself is a God, then how does God get into the God who is body and flesh? So I'm confused about this Jesus Christ. All right. Um, well, I think that the Holy Ghost is the least known of the Godhead. That's true in the New Testament, that's true in traditional Christian history among the Church Fathers. It's probably true in this dispensation as well, it is in Latter-day Saint doctrine. Um, we don't know much about the Holy Ghost, except the effects of the Holy Ghost. Um, it is true that Latter-day Saints believe that to be God in the full sense, one must be embodied. Uh, which is, again, one of the radical heresies of Mormonism. Uh, but there are several senses in which the, the word God is used in the scriptures. Um, 
you know, uh, Moses is made a god and Pharaoh, and that's obviously a very different sense of God. Um, I've just been sitting here since I didn't know this was going to be the topic of discussion tonight. I've been coming up with with other uh, talking points about uh, about the use of the term God in the Bible. Uh, Jesus says in, in John 10:34, "Ye are gods," quoting from Psalm 82, and he says the scripture cannot be broken. Obviously, he's meaning that in a different sense than the sense in which the Father alone is God. Um, and so there is another sense in which the Holy Ghost is God. The Holy Ghost is God. Uh, again, we don't know this. In Latter-day Saints have speculated, gosh, is it possible that, that the Holy Ghost is, is holding an office? It will eventually go on, you know, through the, the... You know, this gets into really wild Mormon doctrine. This is, this is where we're so different from everybody else. But uh, we don't really know. Uh, but the question is, the Holy Ghost a spiritual passionless being? No, absolutely not. We don't believe in passionless deities. In, in the Latter-day Saint tradition, I see no scriptural evidence for a passionless God. Uh, in the Quran and in the Bible, uh, you have God showing wrath, okay? and certainly in the uh, in the scriptures, you have discussion of God as merciful. Now, I know there are philosophical, technical, technical ways of describing this as being, because I've read Maimonides and I've read Al Ghazali, where you can you can talk about God. Um, having these attributes without feeling emotions. Uh, but it seems to me the plain testimony in Scripture, certainly in the Bible, is that God feels anger, anger, mercy, love, all those sorts of emotions. And so we don't believe that to be a God, you have to be passionless. In fact, the idea of a passionless God is incomprehensible to us in the bad sense. <laughs> we realize that God is beyond our comprehension, but this just doesn't make sense to us, and it doesn't seem to have scriptural warrant. Okay. Mr. Shabiri, uh, is Allah jealous according to Islam? And how does this relate uh, to the fact that Allah or God has no son, daughter, or father? Number two, can we be expected as intelligent beings over all other creation to believe in a God that, cha uh, that changes or changes or charges and shares uh, equals? Doesn't this, doesn't this cause confusion to the people? Please explain and simplify. Can you repeat the last part for me about the charges? Yes. It says, can we be expected as intelligent beings over all other creation to believe in a God that I think changes and shares equals? Doesn't this cause confusion to people? Please explain and simplify. Now, as for the first part of the question, is God jealous? Well, in the Bible we find this statement about God, that God is a jealous God. Perhaps one of the slides that we showed today actually uh, does include that terminology. Now we know what the Bible is trying to say, and we agree with what the Bible is trying to say in that passage. That God will not accept that we human beings who are created to worship Him should turn around and worship someone else, or not to worship Him. We are created exclusively for His worship, and we should worship none else but Him. This is why this message is repeated so many times in the Bible. But the way in which the Bible put it sometimes may cause uh, consternation to some Muslims because we don't think of God being a, quote-unquote, a jealous God, using that terminology. Uh, but rather we think of our worship as not something that does benefit to God, but that does benefit to us. If we thought of God being jealous, and perhaps this is why it caused difficulty for Muslims, that would represent a scenario like this one. God is sitting up there in the sky expecting us to worship Him. We go to someone else and so He feels jealousy because of the someone else. As if the someone else is uh, you know, someone that would be a rival to Him of some sort. So Muslims don't see it this way. We see that our worship to God benefits us but not God. It does not change God no matter how much we worship Him. All of the people all together can decide to worship Him all their lives. That's not going to make Him any more great than He is already. But it makes us better. For us, the worship is our spiritual food, just like we have to eat three times a day or whatever. Uh, we also have to pray five times a day. So it is our spiritual food. So the, it, it, the bottom line is that we don't speak of God as being a jealous God, but we, we do understand what the Bible is trying to say, that we should worship none but the one true God who is shown by the Bible. But now what about the idea of him having you know, children, okay, parents, and, and other relatives? Perhaps what the questioner means to imply here is that 
Um, if we intelligent beings like to have all of these things for ourselves, and if God is a jealous God, why wouldn't God want to have all of these things for himself as well? Well, we want things for ourselves that we feel would be beneficial to us. Otherwise, there might be many things that other people have, but we don't want them. Or there might be things or traits that animals have, but we don't want them. Uh, you know, we might see somebody who is um, following, you know, one of the heavy metal type of music. They might wear the hair in a particular way. Now, are we jealous of them because they have the hair in a particular way? No, we might even despise uh, that way of wearing one's hair. So, we're not jealous of that because somebody else has got it. We would only be jealous if somebody has something that we feel really ought to be our own. Now, in the sense of us having relatives and so on, God doesn't have to be jealous of that and, and desire the same thing for himself because these things can be of no benefit to God. In fact, in one passage in the Quran, God specifically says that he is not in need of any son in reply to those who uh, think that God should have a son. But uh, throughout the Quran, God represents himself as a ghani, which means self-sufficient. Self he doesn't need anything or anyone. And in fact, he doesn't need for anyone to worship him. He doesn't need children, and so on. Now, the other part is about uh, God changing. Now, Muslims believe that God actually does not change. And uh, we find passages in the Bible, for example, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, where it says, I am the Lord, I do not change. When I say I am the Lord, you must recall I am Jehovah. Jehovah doesn't change according to the Bible. In a similar sense, Muslims understand that God does not change. Although I cannot think of any particular scripture reference in, in the Quran or in the Hadith which actually declares this. Uh, but it seems to us uh, as, as simple, straightforward understanding that if God is perfect already, as Muslims conceive Him to be, then the change would be either to change for the better or for the worse. And if he changes for the better, that means he wasn't perfect before. If he changes for the worse, that means he's no longer perfect. So, in any case, this is not a, a point of Muslim affirmation. A Muslim doesn't have to affirm that God changes or doesn't change. Uh, but it is something that is commonly believed by Muslims that God doesn't change. Does that fully answer the question, do you think? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, it's running on, along the same line. Uh, as opposed to Islam, the person asked... How does, uh, or how can Mormon, uh, a Mormon or Mormon church, uh, lend support to its doctrine that God lives in a family unit and has a wife, family, mother, what they call, you know, and then living in a, uh, begetting children, spirit children, as, as Mormons believe, from the Bible, and also from the Book of Mormon. Because there is no single passage in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon stating clearly uh, explicitly that God is married and has a heavenly wife or heavenly mother as Mormons believe. Please explain. Well, there are relatively few statements like that in, in uh, Latter-day Saint discussion generally. Uh, this is not something that we expect to find taught throughout the Bible if we don't. But there are references to it. I mentioned one from Acts 17 where it says that, uh, that we are God's offspring, his genos, his family. One of the words that's, uh, the, that is often translated by the Greek word genos, his family, or race. Uh, which would certainly seem to imply children of God, and so the other things could be deduced from that. Most of what we know about uh, about a heavenly mother is the extent we know anything come about in uh, in this particular body period, um, and and it percolated late into Latter-day Saint thought. Although I, I think that it's no less true for that, but you don't find it explicitly taught in Joseph Smith. Um, you find little traces of it in a hymn, Oh My Father. And when that hymn was written, it was brought to the leaders of the church who said, Yes, that's true. But this didn't come about in a dra dramatic way. It was something that was gradually seen as the implication of certain other ideas. For example, the idea that God is our Father and that we're His offspring. Um, which is biblically attested. The, the uh, New Testament commonly refers to God the Father as the Father. Uh, and we're described as His children. So it flows from that. Um, in the Book of Mormon, I can't think of any particular passage that would teach a doctrine like that, though it's not inconsistent with what the Book of Mormon teaches. Uh, he, he wants to know that he doesn't have a name, Muhammad, written Muhammad, you know, as, and he explains that his Muslim friend told him that 
not only in, in Bible, uh, Prophet Muhammad has been mentioned in Hindu and Persian scriptures. So he would like to, you to clarify, is it true or false statement by that guy? Commonly what is given in the scriptures about future figures is not so much the name but their description. For example, many Christians believe that Jesus can be found all over the, the Old Testament, but you won't find his name there. In fact, even what is given as his name turns out not to be his name. Uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 7, we are told that the child who is going to be born will be called Emmanuel. But we cannot find in the New Testament anywhere that Jesus was actually called Emmanuel. Uh, so it, the focus usually you know, is not on the name of the person, but on his description. And there's a few things that are left, perhaps deliberately a little bit obscure, to let the people think, reflect, and, and do a little bit of searching to determine who is that figure that God is saying he's going to send. In a similar sense, perhaps, if we approach the Old Testament, looking for the Prophet Muhammad, of whom we peace, we find him all over the place as well. Uh, we find him, for example, in a passage which we looked at previously, where it says that uh, according to the understanding of the earliest Christians, Jesus must remain in heaven until that prophet comes, who was promised through Moses, when God said he's going to send a prophet by Moses. So that prophecy, that prophecy is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 18, in verses 12 to 18. We find here in Acts chapter 3 that the earliest Christians are still looking forward to the fulfillment of that prophecy. In some passages, in one particular passage, I should say, the, the name Muhammad is actually mentioned in, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, giving a description there about a certain bridegroom. And there in chapter 5, verse 16, it says in the Hebrew, he is Muhammad. But in English translations, it is usually rendered, he is altogether lovely. So the, the reader of the English Bible has no clue that Muhammad is mentioned there in the Hebrew Bible. Now, the, the fact that the Song of Solomon has been troubling to many interpret, interpreters, the Jewish interpreters have commonly said, because the, the story has a lot of sexual connotations, the imagery there is, it, is one of a bride and bridegroom perhaps sharing uh, their, their bridal night. And uh, the, the description is, is very uh, graphic in some places, and some have been puzzled by the inclusion of this book as one of the uh, contents of the Word of God. So the and Jewish commentators have said that actually it doesn't mean what it sounds like, that this is actually a description of God and the people of Israel. So, so God being the bridegroom, the people of Israel being the bride in this case. Christian commentators have generally said that this is actually a description, again, not of a bride and bridegroom uh, involved uh, in privacy, but rather this is a description between Jesus and his bride, meaning the church, the church being the bride of Christ. Uh, so looking at it this way, I wonder if this could not be a description of Muhammad and his woman, or Muhammad and his community, especially since his name is mentioned in, in chapter 5, verse 16. There, there's mention of Muhammad and be peace on other passages too. There's a book uh, written on this subject by one, uh, Abdul Haq Vidyarti. He's written a book entitled Muhammad in the World Scriptures, and he has found reference to the Prophet Muhammad in scriptures of Hinduism, of uh, Zoroastrianism, the ancient uh, Persian religion. He's found even references in, in the Buddhist scriptures, and uh, the, of course the Jewish and Christian scriptures as well. So there are references in many scriptures. Muslims are not surprised by this because in the Quran we learn that when God uh, chose Muhammad as be peace, God uh, made a covenant from with all the other prophets that they are going to help and support the Prophet Muhammad. So we find it very appropriate that in their own ministries, each one of these prophets may have made mention of the final prophet to come by way of helping him, in other words, by preparing the minds of their listeners to follow the last of all of the prophets. This is Dr. Peterson. It's about uh, explanation on the concept of plan of salvation. The questioner asks, how uh, how come Elohim, who was also fathered by another father, all of a sudden appear, start asking uh, to call for a great council, and then uh, basically it says that how could he be so much authoritative over all other gods who existed before me who are more knowledgeable than him according to the law of eternal progression so who have learned and gone through this exaltation and they learn more than this Elohim how could Elohim all of a sudden have so much charge over these other senior gods and call for the council and then make the decision also along the same line he says he asks how come, uh, 
Elohim, who is supposed to be according to Mormon belief, is perfect. Can we get two imperfect children? Jesus, he's so perfect, and Lucifer, who is so cunning. How could two different beings can come from the same perfect? If he's perfect, he should always be get perfect things. Not imperfect. So that does away, do away with his perfection. Moral perfection is the problem. Would that it were. Um, the but, uh, so I, I don't think I understand the basis on which a question like that is framed. But uh, also in terms of, of this notion of Elohim calling together a council of God's senior to him, I don't know of any reason to believe that that's so. Uh, we don't have any reason, we do not have any reason to believe that there, are gods, that there were gods in this council who were senior to Elohim. Uh, we don't know anything about that. We know very little. Again, we just have to state here that, that uh, you know, we have to be humble in the face of these sorts of things. We don't know. Uh, we don't, and I'm not making that as a statement that Latter-day Saint theology is a mess. It's just that, uh, it's just that uh, we don't know about Elohim's prior history. We're not told that. You may hear some folk Mormon ideas about this. Maybe some of you may have seen that President Hinckley in the past uh, couple of months given a, given a couple of interviews to... Uh, to the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, with someone else, I don't remember who, Newsweek maybe, or U.S. News and World Report, I think it was U.S. News and World Report, and was asked about this very question, what about the Father and his becoming God? And President Hinckley's answer was, we don't know much about that. But he didn't want to get into it, and he's exactly right on that. We know certain very basic things, but we don't know beyond that. And it's illegitimate to speculate beyond that. So we don't know anything about Elohim's prior history, whatever it may have been. And we don't know about any other gods beyond Elohim. And if we say we do, there's nothing in the scriptures to back us up on that. And there's no reason to believe there were any gods senior to Elohim in that council. So again, the question is misframed, I think. Okay. This one, Brother Shabiyani, could you uh, briefly address the nature of Allah as uh, believed by Muslim uh, faith? Uh, specifically, where does he come from, and what his purpose? In Islam, we do not ask where where God has come from. And in fact, the Prophet Muhammad, whom be peace, uh, told us that when we start thinking about God, and uh, the the devil will keep uh, asking us to think further and further, further. and he will get us to the point where we where we start asking, well, if God created everyone else, well, who created God? So he said at that point, say, I seek refuge in God from Satan, the accursed one, and, and uh, you know, then think about something else, but don't try to ponder over this point. When we try to think about the person of God, obviously our limited mind is here being exercised to, to think of someone who is beyond our understanding. Uh, can the, the thing that is made have a complete understanding of its maker? And often we say this is not the case, we cannot. So rather than try to think about the person of God, how he must exist, and where was he before he created the world, and all of this kind of thing, uh, he said just actually think, think of the attributes of God, what we know about him, uh, the names and attributes that are described in the Quran and the Hadith concerning God, and he, what, what exactly he does, how does he relate to human beings, the fact of his justice, his kindness, uh, his being stern in punishment, the fact that he is wise, and he gives us uh, laws which make sense, so that we should be happy to obey these laws. These are the things that we should actually ponder on, rather than to think of his person as well. We should also ponder on the things that he created. Look at the things around us, see how well they are organized, see how things are moving around in very precise courses, and that should make us reflect on the power and the mind of God. But don't try to reflect on this person, how exactly uh, he is. So in that sense then, uh, we should say that uh, in, in Islam, the theology does not get into the complex idea of, you know, where, is, where does God come from and, and so on. Now the idea of, the, of God being the prime mover is something that has been uh, well accepted in, in historical Christianity and uh, has been accepted by Muslims as well. Uh, although we don't have a term in the Quran which says that God is the prime mover, this term is a philosophical term. It was uh, Anselm of Canterbury and Thomas Aquinas, the Christian philosophers, who came up with this particular way of speaking about God in the, in the uh, uh, we should say, the monotheistic religion. 
but I think this comes as a logical consequence of what else we understand God to be. If we understand God to be self-sufficient, then He must have existed before anything else existed, because otherwise He would depend on something else for His existence. If He doesn't depend on something else for His existence, but everything else depends on Him, then, of course, He is the prime mover, because He existed before anyone else. A term which comes close to including this idea of God being the prime mover would be a summit in the Qur'an. Uh, which actually includes the idea of God being uh, eternal, having uh, no beginning, no end. In some verses of the Quran, we find that God uh, did actually create uh, uh, things when there was nothing. Um, for example, we find that God originated the creation uh, in, in many passages of the Quran. We find that God will exist when nothing else will remain. For example, in Surah 55, it says, and that everything will pass away but the face of your Lord will remain full of uh, glory and honor and so uh, the, the understanding that God was there before anything else was is very much entrenched in Islamic understanding uh, but we don't ask where he came from May I just add something to that? Yeah. Because that's, that's not unrelated to the question he was asked me, you know, what, was, what about God before the Council and that sort of thing. St. Augustine was asked once what God was doing before he created the universe. And Augustine's answer was, he was creating a hell for people who ask questions like that. <laughs> So apparently that guy who asked the question asked <laughs> Okay, this is for Dr. Peterson. Um, the questioner asked in chapter of Hebrews, uh, book of Hebrews, I mean, chapter 7, verse 3, if you want to check that out. We have Melchizedek, who was neither created from father nor mother, and doesn't have any beginning uh, or end. After whose order Jesus, peace be upon him, received this priesthood, which is supposed to be the highest priesthood after the order of the Ron priest. Why don't you consider him divine as well? Because according to Mormonism, Jesus is a literal son of Elohim, but this Melchizedek doesn't have even a father or mother, and has no beginning and no end. If you think it is Jesus, who is Melchizedek, which is spoken in this verse, then it contradicts what you believe about Jesus, Jesus' birth since he was first born of his father, Elvin, who himself was on Samaria. Please explain. The, uh, the standard LDS interpretation of this, which is not so very different from many common early Christian interpretations, is that it's not Melchizedek who is without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning days nor end of life, but his priesthood. So we don't see Melchizedek as anything more than a man who happened to be a priest and who held his priesthood. So it doesn't involve some contradiction. Okay, let's see. I'm almost done with the letter. I have almost, let's see. We have to write about 10, 15, and 10, 20. So I can have maybe a few more questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up in chocolate. This verse will be on you. Jesus did uh, serve us. He gave us his life for us. But in the New Testament, he is referred to as the Son of God many times. In the Quran, I suppose he is never referred to as the Son of God, the ones believe he is the firstborn of God in the Spirit, the only begotten in the flesh. It's just maybe a comment. But then, uh, along the same line, there's a question by a Mormon brother. He says, as, as we know that Mormons uh, send missionaries to many countries, then it's only the Islamic countries which bar missionaries to proselyte to Muslims. Uh, he wants to see the future uh, of, uh, of a congenial relationship between Muslims and Mormons in particular, and if it would entail anything in the future. And when Muslims would allow basically what he's asking, to uh, open the doors for the gospel. How, how do we see this? Now, the, the question of the sonship of Jesus is something which the Quran speaks about a lot. And, but uh, it, uh, it always refutes the idea that God can have a son. And in fact, it says that uh, the, the preaching of Jesus was that I am a servant of God, I am the Messiah, uh, and that uh, nowhere would we find that Jesus and Holy Peace actually claim uh, something which was not uh, with, with authority from God. And in fact, uh, getting this idea from the Quran and reading the Bible with this perspective, we find actually that, uh, that, that the, the view of scholarship in general 
uh, seems to be right on this point, that Jesus on whom he peace never actually claimed himself to be the Son of God. But this is something that was claimed again after him. If you trace the development of the Gospels, you, you will see that the later the Gospel, the more emphasis there is on Jesus being the Son of God. You find some, some very uh, unique uh, and discoveries that's been made by modern scholarship. For example, they tell us that the Gospel of Mark was written first of the four, and Matthew and Luke after that, and finally the Gospel according to John. If you start with, with the Gospel of Mark, and you see what there is described about Jesus, you find Jesus appearing very much like the Muslim conception of him. And if you go to the last of the four Gospels, the Gospel according to John, you find Jesus appearing very much like the Christian, or the later Christian conception of Him. And you wonder what happened in between. And the obvious answer is that in between, there was the developing tradition about Jesus in the earliest Christian communities. And that last of the four Gospels, the Gospel of John, actually represents the, the last stage of development of that period. In other words, where people have come to see Jesus, that is where Jesus is placed in the last of the four Gospels. But the idea that, Je that Jesus was the Son of God actually was not something that was preached by the earliest disciples. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, which we looked at tonight, once it is translated correctly, we realize that the earliest disciples, like Peter and them, were actually preaching the very things which Muslims believe about Jesus today, that He is the Messiah. In Acts chapter 5, it says that they never stopped going door to door, preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the very thing which Muslims believe today. And in fact, in all of the preachings that we can find from these early disciples, they have kept saying that Jesus is the holy servant of God, whom God anointed and sent with the message. But in the Acts of the Apostles, we find that it was St. Paul who actually first introduced the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. When we get to Acts chapter 9, we find in verse 20 that St. Paul, after his conversion experience, went into the synagogue and began preaching right away that Jesus is the Son of God. So the idea that Jesus is the Son of God came from somewhere and through some channels, and we see this as Muslims, not as something that came from Jesus himself, but something that came through the preachings of others after him. As modern uh, biblical scholarship,